everybody, it's Tracy. I'm here today with Alex and Tree. You probably remember Alex McBath when we interviewed him last year when he was a resident at JPS Hospital here in Fort Worth. Now he is graduated and he's a real life boy. He's a real life <laughs> doctor getting ready to begin his practice. He and Tree have bought a house and um, I'm so excited for them. Since June is Pride Month, I really wanted to mark the occasion by talking with Alex about a special interest of his, which is LGBTQ healthcare. Um, Alex is has a special interest in this, and he is very, very good at it. He gave a talk to the uh, resident class uh, on one of our educational sessions, and I was just blown away by the facts that he knew and the points that he made that most people don't even think of. So Alex, what's it like to be a, a graduate physician and getting ready to embark on your career? <laughs> um, exciting and terrifying. Yeah, yeah that uh, sounds about right. Yeah. I mean, it's just like a relief right now. Of course, you know, I'm only about a week from finishing, so it still just feels like I'm on an extended weekend. It hasn't really sunk in yet that it's all done, but yeah. um, I mean, I'm excited to move on and, and excited to get started, but I'm also excited to have a, a little bit of time off before, before that happens. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine. You have been straight through um, education and training pretty much without a break. You guys manage, I mean, I follow you on Instagram and I know you manage to have fun, but yeah. now I think you're gonna have more of a life. Oh, I hope so. I mean, to the extent allowed, thanks to the, yeah. <laughs> the pandemic, but you know. Well, I mean, two people with careers, I think it's hard to make time for each other, but I think you guys do a really good job of balancing this and I yeah. love, I love <laughs> stalking you on Instagram. <laughs> All right, so what are you looking forward to? How do you picture your practice going? Are you, are you gonna do, I mean, obviously you're in women's healthcare, but what are your other interests? Um, well, obviously I have an interest in LGBTQ healthcare. Um, it's been kind of a big part of my career starting in medical school, you know, back when I was at Tech in El Paso, we started this um, lecture series that is now integrated into the permanent curriculum. And so we kind of designed this lecture that has now evolved into the same one that I gave during residency and to several grand rounds. Um, as far as, you know, just kind of creating a welcoming environment for these patients and then just kind of very, very basic what providers need to know in order to make these patients feel comfortable and safe in coming to them. Um, because historically, you know, these are patients that don't get the care they need, whether they're, you know, personally avoiding it for their own reasons or whether their providers just aren't aware of the topics that are necessary to provide adequate care for these patients. I remember you saying something about that and it was just a real surprise to me, but just when you think about how LGBTQ people are marginalized and they often don't get the health care they need and by the time they seek treatment oftentimes they're sicker and for transgender patients oftentimes, I mean, they don't know which kind of doctor to go to, and it's very difficult for them to know which practices are going to be friendlier and more welcoming. So what do we need to know? Well, um, as far as you know, which practices to go to, there are actually several online databases that are put together by several societies, um, some including locally here in Fort Worth that kind of have a list of LGBTQ friendly providers. Um, really, you know, ultimately it kind of comes down to the provider as to what kind of care they're comfortable providing. Um, of course, you know, us being a women's health care, we're very comfortable with, you know, the female anatomy, but there is also, you know, those trans women who may or may not have had any kind of gender confirming surgery. Um, so they may still have some anatomy that may, you know, be fairly foreign to us. Um, yeah. However, you know, it can be very confirming for them to come to a gynecologist just to kind of um, positively reinforce their gender identity. Um, and even if they don't have, you know, the typical anatomy that we're used to encountering and the kind of screening test that we're used to doing, just kind of going through the motions and, and kind of giving them a, the real, you know, well woman exam can kind of be very empowering for them and mm -hmm. just kind of confirm their identity and let them know that we are comfortable with them and we're, you know, willing to provide them with a full spectrum of health care and make sure that they are well taken care of for their life. That's amazing, and it's something that had never occurred to me before Alex had talked about this. What about for trans men who oftentimes are really, I mean, where do they go for health care and how can you help them? Right, and well that, I mean, that's kind of brings up another issue is that a lot of times that they're not able to seek health care, whether that's for their own, you know, their own fear of being stigmatized or their own personal history of discrimination or just providers not really knowing how to 
deal with their specific issues. I mean, of course, they're, you know, people like everyone else, and they still need all the screenings that we all need, all the usual vaccinations, all the usual testing and things, but then they also have some very specific needs that are unique to their population. Um, LGBTQ patients in general, but specifically the transgender population, tend to be a lot more prone to things like substance abuse or intimate partner violence. Um, thing, you know, they tend to be more dependent on tobacco. Um, they a lot of times will have something in their personal history that has kind of uh, led them to avoid the healthcare industry, whether that, you know, they've presented somewhere and they were just turned away completely, whether people were being outwardly discriminatory against them, or whether they just didn't feel comfortable because people were so obviously uncomfortable taking care of them that it just mm -hmm. kind of drove them away. Right. Um, but now I've kind of forgotten what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think these are such good points to make because it's very hard for them to seek care and to know exactly where to go. Um, so I think that on our questionnaires when we are um, asking people their gender, I mean, there's more than one option. There's, right. there's you know, neither. There's... Uh, male or female and um, you know as oftentimes I'm sure it's difficult for people to voice what their concerns are and as healthcare providers I have found that most of us are not hostile we're just really uncertain so to the LGBTQ community out there we want to do right we want to do the right things please be patient with us and teach us um, how you want to be uh, addressed how you what you need, what your concerns are, and help us get better. And that actually brings up a really good point too. You know, one of the things that people tend to recommend as far as making people feel included is with those intake forms. Is because very often, you know, if you go to your front desk and just say, hey, I want a packet of what new patients get, you can get all the information that they see, you know, right as they hit your door. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's, you know, gender, male, female, it's a little checkbox. And yeah. then that's obviously doesn't include the wide variety of things that people may want to include. Right. So generally they'll say, you know, just include an empty box where people can free write in whatever they identify as um, or however they want to be addressed. Um, of course, you know, for insurance purposes and things, very often we'll need legal names, which sometimes will not reflect their gender identity, but then to have an extra box that has their preferred name or their preferred pronouns or something to that effect so you know how to address them. Because, um, of course, on the back end of things with the billing and all, you know, a lot of times that won't always reflect how they're necessarily addressed right. in public. So as a healthcare industry and insurance industry, um, you know, we have a ways to go before we uh, really kind of get that down. And I'm thinking of my own intake forms and I don't have the options that I need. So note to self, Monday morning, uh, get busy on that. Um, a lot of times there are ways that you can make your office friendly so that a patient would know either on your website or when they walk in your door that you are a safe space. What, what can we do to help enhance that? Right. And so, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do just from even putting something very small. You know, a lot of times in your waiting room, you'll have a bunch of magazines, whether it's health related or not. And just to have something that shows, you know, whether it's a LGBTQ couple or even just something with, you know, the human rights campaign logo on there just to show that it's a safe space. It's something that, you know, a lot of people wouldn't even notice if they weren't actively looking for it, but it can be very reassuring to someone who is part of the population to see that in the waiting room mm -hmm. um, without having to run the risk of, you know, maybe offending some of your other patients and being too outward with them. Right. Um, yeah, it's a dilemma and we're still working on it. I think that very few practices really do it completely right, but most of us want to. If you happen to have an LGBTQ employee in the office, just making sure that they're able to express, you know, their history, um, to be outward and open with the patients, um, kind of make people feel a lot more comfortable if someone who's like them is kind of reflected in the employment at the office. Um, like I said, you know, having something like a poster up in the wall, um, and then of course just being open and friendly when you're kind of encountering these patients, um, and making sure that they know that you are accepting and, and willing to help. and happy to do so. Yeah, I think we all try and we all want to do better. So are there any activities going on, any um, any outreach that's being done with organizations here for healthcare here in Fort Worth or anything that you know about? Where are, who are people who are doing it right and how can we emulate them? 
As far as here in Fort Worth, I'm not familiar with <laughs> a whole lot actually. You know, as I kind of referenced this uh, LGBTQ friendly provider list and the Fort Worth list is actually fairly short. Um, there are some organiza organizations in Dallas, yes. which I'm not sure if you I mean, treat as marketing, so he might, <laughs> he might know a little bit yeah, more about Yeah, I mean, I do outreach. marketing for Prison Health North Texas. Um, we are uh, in Dallas. We have three clinics uh, primarily doing uh, HIV primary care, um, HIV SCI testing and treatment, um, transgender care we do as well, and behavioral health case management. So a lot. It runs the gamut. Um, okay. My suggestion would be if you're wanting to um, open up and be out more out there and be a, a affirming to the community is just there's so many uh fort worth actually has some great um like a service organizations and lgbt organizations and just reach out and ask them what can okay. we do we want to be more affirming we want to welcome these patients to um our practice um what can we do to help and how can you help us because it really you know with the lgbtq community we all kind of work together and we're looking for more you know, doctors and providers who want to do this because it is, you know, if for a provider, it is scary to just kind of start venturing into how do I, you know, I make my practice more affirming. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, you have to train your staff to treat people correctly. You have to put, like um, Alex stated, like, you know, just little things like a poster or something on your website, which is, I really do suggest putting something on your website or social okay. media, it's putting it out there because that's where they're going to look first. Okay. It's on your website and social media if you do. Um, take care of the LGBT community and provide care and um, just kind of start there because these um, organizations around town really do work with other providers because we want more we want a large network of providers to help anybody in our community and um, yeah I think that's the best way to go to be honest. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing this, people? I'm kind of excited. I'm gonna get online today <laughs> to see how I can help. And since I know a lot of you who are watching are healthcare providers yourselves, um, nursing staff, physicians, medical assistants, and just community members who want to reach out and do what they can to help, um, I'll have a list of links uh, at the bottom so that you can reach out and get on the list and see how it is that you can help in your community. So Alex and Tree, congratulations on your new life. I know there are great things ahead of you. You can't, you can't fail. I mean, you've got hearts of gold. You really have a heart for what it is that you guys do. And I think the future looks great for you guys. You guys look for Alex and Tree on social media. And if you need a wonderful, wonderful women's healthcare provider, um, you know where to look. So happy Pride Month. We're getting ready to go into the kitchen and eat some scones. For this and other great information, head over to the blog, drtracypapa.com slash free gift.